That'll do it. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Tony Lacola. I'm the treasurer of the National Capital uh, Chapter. I'd like to welcome you today to our session, Past, Present, and Future, a look at St. Elizabeth's East and West Campus. Um, just a little housekeeping. Um, you will find at the uh, chapter website a link to APA National where you can log your CM credit hours if need be. Um, there is a section in Zoom where you can log your questions. If you have any questions, feel free um, to put those in there and we'll try to get those answered at the end of our session. We are having a little technical difficulty. One of our panelists got logged out and has not been able to log back in. She will be joining us. She was our moderator and the first presenter in the lineup of four people. So bear with us, she might log in and we'll get to her at some point during the presentation. Um, that should do it. Um, I think Christy Turnstall will be leading us off given the fact that Julia is not on with us right now. So Christy, go ahead, take over, um, share your screen and we can get underway. And thank you, thank you for joining us. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And again, um, Julia Coster was supposed to join us today and um, was going to give you a wonderful overview that kind of blends the work that's been happening on the St. Elizabeth campus um, and orients you to the campus in the city. Um, GSA, um, I, I, my, first of all, my name is Christy Tunstall Williams. I am the deputy director of GSA's um, National Capital Region's Office of Planning and Design Quality. Um, our mission within GSA is to make sure that we are um, delivering high quality design um, for the region, both for our federal tenants as well as um, for the community. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, is it, can you guys see my screen, Tony? We can, um, you might wanna go to a slideshow mode. Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, so we're here to talk about the St. Elizabeth's campus. Um, and I will start. So the General Services Administration um, is the, for those who aren't familiar with the General Services Administration, we are essentially the civilian federal landlord. We design, build, and maintain all federal civilian architecture um, across the country. Obviously, we have um, a great preponderance of it here in the National Capital Region. Um, initially, We'll talk about the St. Elizabeth campus and what if for those of you who aren't familiar, this is located in Ward 8 in Anacostia. Um, it is a National Historic Landmark campus and it um, encompasses more than 300 acres um, in the in in Anacostia. So you'll see on the screen, and I apologize, I'm not well scripted for this overview. Um, you'll see on the screen the, the National Historic Landmark boundary. Right down the middle, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, is Martin Luther King Avenue. So GSA's campus is to the left, or what we call the West Campus. The city's campus is to the east, um, called the East Campus, um, on the right-hand side of the screen. So I will go over what GSA has been doing to redevelop the West Campus, and then I'll pass it over to my colleagues with the DC Office of Planning um, to talk through the city's plans for the East Campus. Um, as you can see, the campus, um, what's shown right now is a National Historic Landmark campus. The buildings are colored in different in different colors. So the original campus was um, chartered in the 1850s by Dorothea Dix, was a famous social reformer. 
the um, goal was to provide humane uh, mental health care, which was new in that time. One of the central tenets of the development of the St. Elizabeth's campus was that architecture and landscape could have a therapeutic effect on um, individuals experiencing um, mental health issues. And so the campus grew up over time. There were um, roughly four building campaigns over its history. The earliest one starting in 1850s, going to roughly 1900. These tend to be smaller cottage residential type buildings. From the 1900s to the 1930s, the buildings um, expanded. These were largely administration buildings, open wards. Um, the, the sort of philosophy of mental health care did evolve. Um, a number of early uh, brain studies and um, sort of the science of mental health did actually happen on the St. Elizabeth campus. They pioneered a number of um, sort of treatment techniques as well as um, just studies of, of the brain. In the 1930s, most of that development happened on the East Campus. Again, um, additional expansion of the administration and residential dorms. And then there was a, a final push in the 1950s um, that again, just further expansion of the hospital. A number of those 1950s buildings have been removed at this point. And then I kind of think of it as we're in the, the sixth phase um, and we're adding buildings now. Um, GSA's mission right now is to redevelop this headquarters for the headquarters of the um, Department of Homeland Security. And then the city has a, a mixed use development going on um, on the East Campus that they'll talk about later in the presentation. Um, so I covered part of this campus history, again, um, established in 1852. Um, the Government Hospital for the Insane was established at the site. It was rena renamed, I'm just going to hit the high points here, um, in, the 19, in 1916 for St. Elizabeth's, which was after the original land grant for the um, hospital. And again, some of that was even at that time, um, there was awareness that there was some stigma to mental health. So uh, we had a number of veterans, Civil War veterans and other war veterans convalescing there on the campus. And so they renamed it to um, a more... Um, my sanitized uh, reflection of what was going on. So the campus obviously developed over time. I talked through that on the slide. Um, in 1979, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, as a historic site, it, the East and West campuses are treated as a single entity. Um, however, as we've developed the site, it has been bifurcated for the West Campus to GSA, East Campus to DC. Um, in 1987, the campus was transferred from the US Department of Health and Human Services to the DC Department of Health. Um, in 1990, it became listed as a National Historic Landmark and was added to the DC Inventory of Historic Sites. In 2001, HHS reported the West Campus, which is what GSA has, access to their needs. And this is kind of where GSA's history picks up. In 2004, we acquired the site from HHS. And um, in 2005, we initiated our compliance, our regulatory compliance activities, which I'll talk a little bit about um, in the next section, um, to redevelop the campus for a secure federal enclave. At that time, they had not um, determined that it would definitely be for DHS, but we knew that there was a need um, in the area. Um, in 2008, GSA finalized our um, National Environmental Policy Act and National Historic Preservation Act compliance. And with that, the master plan for the original um, the initial redevelopment of this campus was approved by the National Capital Planning Commission. Um, in, in 2009, the American Recovery and Re excuse me, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was passed, um, and that sort of jump-started phase one of the development on the campus, which included um, major infrastructure, roads, utilities, things like that. Um, perimeter security, and then as well as the, the headquarters for the US Coast Guard and a number of smaller adaptive reuse buildings. In 2012, we did the first amendment to the master plan, which I'll talk about a little bit. It was a relatively small amendment, but I will talk about that. In 2019 to 13, phase one of um, design and construction went on. Uh, since 2014 to now, we're in phase 2A of the construction. And I'll talk about that. This will make sense as I, as I show the map. Um, and we have just completed um, another master plan amendment, which is really a much larger change um, than the 2012 one, um, which I will talk about how we got there. 
So again, starting with the 2009 master plan, um, you all are a bunch of planners. I don't know how many of you have experience in the federal realm, but wanted to talk a little bit about the regulatory compliance and the public consultation that we um, as a federal agency are subject to. The first one is the National Environmental Policy Act, which directs federal agencies when planning projects or issuing permits to conduct environmental reviews um, and consider the impact of our projects on the environment. And the environment is pretty broad under NEPA. It includes transportation, soil, water, animals, cultural resources. I mean, you name it, um, if there is an environmental or um, both built or natural realm impact, NEPA is looking at it. Um, there are a variety of different NEPA compliance documents that um, agencies may execute depending on the scope and scale of their um, undertakings. The, the most minimal is a categorical exclu exclusion or a CADEX, which is generally just a simple um, perfunctory paperwork ex exercise that is for, you know, purchase of supplies, regular recurring actions, things that are not, um, would be unlikely to have any sort of environmental impact. The next stage is a CADEX checklist, which is slightly more involved. Maybe we do a little bit more analysis, again, still really in-house um, for re rather routine activities that a, an agency would do. The next one is um, an environmental as assessment or an EA. Um, this is a, a little bit higher. We are looking um, more deeply, but we generally to conclude an EA would come out with a finding of no significant impact. And then if you can't get there, then you move on to an environmental impact statement, which is what was done for a project of this scale and complexity. Um, this is a you know, several um, hundred page document that looks at pretty every aspect of the campus and the impacts of our various um, build schemes on those elements. Um, this is a multi-year effort. You can see on the slide here, this is essentially three years. Our initial notice of intent um, and public scoping began in 2005 and did not conclude with the final EIS until the end of 2008. Um, all throughout this, NEPA does have um, specific public touch points when we go out and seek public comment, the initial public scoping. Uh, we go out to the community, tell them what our intent is, what we're doing, and solicit feedback about concerns they may have for us to address in our um, compliance activities. And then we also issue the draft environmental impact statement that is, you know, we've gone out, we've done the due diligence, this is what we found. We solicit um, feedback at that point. And then we issue the final um, EIS and our record of decision once we've been able to address all the comments. Um, sometimes on a parallel path, sometimes on a separate path, we have our National Historic Preservation Act compliance, specifically Section 106, which requires federal agencies to identify and, as and assess the effects of our actions on historic resources. Um, we must, there's also a public consultation part of this um, process. And again, depending on the project and the agency, the scope of that is less um, defined than it would be in NEPA for a project of this scale in um, a sensitive neighborhood. It was rather extensive um, and, and often actually quite contentious. Uh, the, the idea of bringing a retrofitting a National Historic Landmark, which is the highest level of um, sort of historic designation in the country. There's only about 2000 nationwide. This is one of them. So that kind of signals that this is a special place. But the, the um, campus also had a long history of ties to the community and community access. And the concern about taking that away and converting the campus to a, a level five, um, very secure, high security campus um, had was not without concern. Um, from the community. So this was um, a very protracted and often quite contentious consultation that we went through to get to the master plan that we ultimately ended up with. Um, we had many, um, probably more than two dozen consulting party meetings. The consulting parties in this project, it, which is unusual, we had more than probably a hundred different entities, some of them private citizens, many of them community, um, community groups or preservation interest groups. Over time, the, the consulting parties have sort of lessened as people have become accustomed to the campus. GSA has built a track record and they we've built some trust with the community, um, both the, the um, adjacent 
community as well as the, the preservation community in the city and nationwide. So now most of our consultation is with our um, external agency review staff, like the National Capital Planning Commission, the Commission of Fine Arts, the DC State Historic Preservation Office, the DC Preservation League. Um, but whenever we do undertake a new project on the campus, we do go out and, and solicit our full consulting party list. Um, so in 2008, we came up with a programmatic agreement for the campus. Again, like NEPA, there are several different um, levels of agreement documents that could happen. If you're going to have no adverse effect, you can just document it. The SHPO um, concurs. You move on. You may have a, a memorandum of agreement, which is for a specific project, and you know what the adverse effects are, and you can avoid minimize or mitigate them. For a programmatic ag agreement, this is for a, like the large campus development. What we've done is we set out the terms that we will consult with the community on for every project that moves forward under the master plan. Um, in some instances, we've been able to shorten required review timeframes and things like that. We've also agreed to a bunch of um, mitigation measures up front that we know that our impact on this resource is quite large. Um, most of those have to deal with historic documentation, um, community access through tours, uh, websites. We did recently, um, actually it's been a couple of years at this point, uh, um, exhibit at the National Building Museum about the history of the campus, um, which also included some information about other similar campuses as well as um, the history of mental health in the country. Um, so it, you name it, we have been looking at it for this campus. And ultimately, this is the master plan that came up in 2009. It was uh, January of 2009. It was approved by the National Capital Planning Commission. Um, if you look at this, the, the image, the buildings in brown are the existing historic buildings. The ones that are more of a creamy yellow color are the new construction buildings that um, we were agreed to. You'll see there are kind of two major areas. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Again, down here is what is the headquarters um, of the, the US Coast Guard, some new parking. And then this is what we call the plateau site. And, and this is important to watch because this is the big change for the 2020 master plan. You'll note the buildings are, are rather small in scale. They have, they follow the um, sort of wing and connector um, massing language that you see in the historic buildings. Um, in, in the case of the Coast Guard, it, it steps down the, um, the hillside. This, uh, what I didn't mention and what Julia would have is, is the campus is sited on the topographic bowl, so the green ring around the city. So it was very important that we maintain that as we deal with inserting new construction um, in the campus. So the total um, in, in the red box down at the bottom, we were initially in 2009 planning for 14,000 um, employees to be assigned to the campus. We were planning for 4.5 million square feet of, of office space, 1.5 million of uh, parking for a total of 6 million um, square feet of development on the campus. One thing that to note at the top of the screen on the East Campus, the initial master plan did include a parcel for FEMA um, that we were going to acquire from the city and put the, the FEMA campus, the FEMA headquarters building over there. There was just simply not capacity to hold them all on the West Campus. Um, that um, plan has evolved over time and I'll talk about that as we move through. So the lessons learned, the, the original master plan was approved in 2009. We've had 11 years of development and um, we've learned a lot and that will influence what I'll show you for the 2020 master plan. So first and foremost, the bu existing building com condition. Unfortunately, as we got into rehab of uh, and adaptive reuse of some of the existing buildings, we discovered they are actually in far worse condition condition that was, than was initially anticipated. While they had been mothballed, they still, um, in some cases, some of these buildings have been vacant for upwards of 40 years. Um, and then they also had a number of deficiencies due to the original con construction. So um, voids, sort of limited wall thickness, insufficient um, structural capacity, things like that. Um, the other thing we learned is that the, the floor plates are relatively inefficient for modern office use. Um, and some of that is due to the, the, the stepped nature of the buildings, the narrow wings, the, the um, limited core elements, as well as site design constraints. You know, we, we um, as we plan for the master plan, we also have um, design guidelines that set 
heights for new construction. Um, you can see the Coast Guard building at the, the lower part of the slide. That actually steps down the hillside, which I think there's, oh gosh, I don't know, 10 or 11 different floor levels, but not all the elevator banks connect. And some of these were driven by you know, preservation constraints and development concerns. Um, so what happened is the buildings are much more inefficient than originally anticipated. We planned for a one to three ratio for usable to gross, and we're actually um, closer to two and in some cases above. Um, so what that means is we just haven't been able to get as many people on the campus as we had originally planned. Uh, next thing, construction costs have been much higher. The adaptive reuse costs were nearly twice what was originally budgeted. Um, we've also had a number of unforeseen conditions due to soil and slope instability um, that they've had to address both with the construction of the Coast Guard building and with future, um, I'll, I'll show you, um, uh, some plans for the CISA headquarters, which will also address that. And then lastly, we've had cost escal escalations due to funding delays. Um, the initial plan was that the whole campus would be redeveloped by, um, I think 2022 was the last of it, and we are nowhere near that. Um, last lesson is just the funding realities. So since 2006, GSA has only received 38% of our requested funds for the campus. Um, we've had, that said, we've had substantial um, investment in the campus, um, but a lot of it is in the terms of infrastructure to support the full build out. And so it's not necessarily visible. And we haven't been able to really demonstrate that we can um, consolidate um, DHS, all of their many lease locations onto the campus. So um, we had new leadership come in and say, okay, if we're gonna have this project continue, um, both congressional leadership as well as agency leadership, we need to shift our focus and focus on new construction, try to um, get some more efficient buildings planned um, that we could build more um, cost effectively. And, and really the goal here is to demonstrate to Congress and um, our authorizers that yes, we can do this and it's still um, a viable um, project to move forward with. So we went back out to our consulting parties and began discussion about um, ways that we could achieve these goals. And we looked at um, two particular sites, this plateau site that I mentioned, which is on the right hand side of your screen and a small site um, sort of to the north of what is the center building um, here for um, a, a small component of DHS. And the goal was to provide maximum flexibility for um, current and future department programming within the historic context. So after, it was about a two year process um, to get through the revised master plan. And this is what we're looking at now. So again, if you look at the plateau, the, the previous plan had um, a number of historic buildings interspersed with smaller um, new construction buildings. There was no construction here where I'm showing the INA site. Um, so the, the shift is that we now have 1.3 million square feet on this plateau. It's an add of about 400,000 square feet than was previously planned. Um, and then we have a new building in this location, um, which is a critical um, infrastructure piece of the DHS. Um, headquarters. And one thing I should note while I'm on this slide, while I'll show you completed images, this long sort of stepped building is the is what's the center building, which is really the center piece of the campus. That is the building that started in um, 1850. And this has now been fully retrofitted and the DHS um, Office of the Secretary has occupied that building. What you're seeing um, with the little pond is the, the Monroe US Coast Guard building. Um, and then the two large plateau buildings so all told, we ended up, we have increased the campus population slightly. It will, um, we're planning for 14,900 um, people. On the campus, office development will be 4.1 million square feet. So previously, when we were talking east and west campus, we were at 4.5. So total program has, has shrunk. However, program on the, the west campus has grown because we um, were previously at 3.8. Um, so for that, and the, the parking also grew. And so for a total now, we're at 5.7 million square feet between parking and um, office development. Um, 
on the campus. And so what I will do now is just show you some of our completed construction projects before I turn it over to the city to talk about theirs. Um, the first and, and largest building on the campus so far is the Douglas A. Monroe Building. As I said, this is the US Coast Guard headquarters. Um, it was completed in 2013. This was the, the Recovery Act funding. It um, is a LEED Gold building. Um, 1.2 million gross square feet, so rather large. Um, but if you've been on the campus or you've seen the campus from the river, it, it really does, um, was successful in the way it blends into the hillside, um, does not have a massive feel on that topographic bowl. The next is the center building. This is the, this was most recently completed. It opened in um, 2019 and the secretary occupied. Um, this is only 268. Um, thousands, uh, yeah, 268,000 square feet. Also, um, a lead gold building. The original building was begun in 1859 and completed in 1895. Um, let's see what else. This is another smaller building that was just recently completed. This is the West Edition. It is attached to the center building. This is completely new construction um, for uh, one of the components of DHS. It does connect, you'll see in the lower. Um, building by a sort of glass hyphen to the historic center building. Um, this one has just recently been um, designated as lead platinum. And the last one I was going to show you is another adaptive reuse. We've done a number of small adaptive reuse buildings, but um, this is the most recent one to come online. This is Hitchcock Hall. Um, the, the campus was a sort of fully, um, it was all, almost like a little village. So they had their theater, some of the, the theater um, included uh, therapy activities, but they also, there's a fire station, there's an ice house. There was, we had our own, um, uh, railroad spur, bakery, creamery. So a number of those small buildings, dining hall, have already been renovated, but this is the most recent one to come online. It was just completed um, in the third quarter of 2020. Um, and the important thing to note about this is there is the um, opportunity for the community after hours to use this building. Um, it's located very close to the, the perimeter wall um, and they can work with DHS and it is a fully um, functioning 21st century uh, theater space for um, DHS uses it for um, all hands meetings. It's also the only location and the first time in DHS's history that the secretary can speak to all of the um, different DHS locations in one place so he can go there and connect to every DHS outpost across the country. Um, so it's very important for them, but also um, as a, a symbol of our partnership with the community. And then the last one is the one that's on the books. We've just recently um, re received um, approval from CFA and NCPC for the design of the cybersecurity and infrastructure security headquarters. This will be the first building built on the plateau under the new master plan. One of the important things to note about this building is um, we have a, another area of slope instability here and the building will be acting rather than inserting a big retaining wall, um, a gash kind of through the campus, the building itself will act as the retaining wall. So it is bridging what, what you can't tell in plan. This is the, there's a tremendous topographical change from the, the top of the campus down to where the Monroe building is. So this building will kind of act as a bridge. We're um, creating a nice um, amenity space for, um, staff to be able to walk from the lower campus up. It's currently not, not at all accessible. So this building is, serves a kind of a key function um, in, in bridging the upper and lower campuses. And here are some elevations of what you'll see. What you're seeing in the foreground is the original um, powerhouse um, for the campus that will be um, retrofitted. It's largely storage, but there is some um, utility um, service still going on in that building and adjacent to the building. Um, another view, this is the ravine walk that I was talking about, looking back towards the building. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues at the city to talk about their side of the campus. Great. Thank you, Christy. You're I welcome. I begin sharing my screen. All right, good, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Evelyn Tasango, and I am with the Office of Planning. I am 
the previous Ward 8 planner, it's been several years now, but I actually, I worked on the redevelopment plan for both the 2008 framework plan and then also the 2012 master plan and design guidelines. So today we're gonna to talk um, a little bit more about the East Campus and the development that's occurring on that side. So a lot of planning is taking place on the East Campus of St. Elizabeth's with the culmination being the completion of the 2008 uh, St. Elizabeth's East Redevelopment Framework Plan, which was approved by council at that same time. Um, now, why did we select St. Elizabeth's as this redevelopment opportunity? Well, one of the reasons is due to its massive size. It's 180 acres, which offered one of the largest redevelopment sites in the district. Um, secondly, it offered the opportunity to open up the campus. It was enclosed with the gate around it, not really welcoming to the community in which it served, Congress Heights neighborhood. So this was an opportunity to open up the campus into this vibrant neighborhood center and also this emerging innovation economy at the time, which was a bustling economy. And then finally, the process just offered a unique opportunity for extensive engagement with a plethora of stakeholders, including federal partners, also local and regional stakeholders who all took part of this effort to really enhance and engage all of the opportunities that existed with the redevelopment of the East Campus. So again, we started with the initial planning took place in 2003. That was even prior to me um, becoming a, a, a member of the Office of Planning. And so from there, there were nine guiding principles that we'll get to a little bit later that were created as part of the East Campus. Three years later is when we started the initial planning for the redevelopment, the framework plan, but it was not submitted to council at that time. There were still a lot of unknowns about the site, where particular land uses would be located, um, what were some of the development densities, heights, things of that nature. So it took some time for us to, again, engage the community, engage our partners and determine a final plan that ultimately the community had far more input into than we had, than they had originally. And then we submitted that, count, that plan to council in 2008 for submission. And then finally in 2012, because the framework plan was just that, it was a framework. It set the areas where development would occur. It, it identified the land uses, um, but the 2012 master plan and design guidelines offered much more specificity in terms of specific land uses, road networks, um, and that plan did not have to go to council because again, it just really did strengthen the framework plan, which was submitted by council, but it did its best in terms of, like I said earlier, providing greater specificity in terms of how those uses would be allocated throughout the site. And for the timeline, um, as far as the East Campus goes, as Christy mentioned earlier, it, it was an iterative process in terms of West Campus planning and East Campus planning. But for the East Campus, again, as I mentioned, we started early in January and the process included five community workshops and events that occurred throughout that year. Um, two years later, special East Campus planning sessions were held with the community. And again, further refinement to the plan was made at that point, more further input was needed. Finally, in 2006, we did revise the plan with the advisory committee, and then the, pan, the plan was postponed again because there were still a lot of question marks in terms of would we actually have a federal tenant that would um, be situated on the East Campus? Um, what would some of those land uses consist of? Uh, would we have the amenities and goods and services that were needed on the campus to activate the campus? So a lot of those questions remained um, unanswered. And we spent a little bit further time trying to make those decisions, ultimately resulting in the adoption of the 2008 framework plan, and then also having further discussions with GSA about an East Campus opportunity and a tenant being located on the East Campus. We did a lot of coordination, as I had mentioned before, with GSA and DHS. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the, the federal government was able to provide uh, a guaranteed tenant for the district property being FEMA. We had a lot of negotiations about that being located on the East Campus, because as Christy mentioned again, there wasn't really enough room for that to take place on the West Campus. So the coordination also kicked off redevelopment of the East Campus, and it expanded retail and housing choices for residents, as well as federal employees, as we saw moving to the area with the new development um, of the East Campus development with FEMA, we thought that that would be an opportunity to live where you work. 
And then also proactively addressing transportation and infrastructure and some of the utility challenges that came with the new development um, of the East Campus. And then more importantly, we wanted to connect this massive undertaking with other planned development, which was percolating in the Ward 8 neighborhood and having a linkage between all of the new development, which would ultimately serve the residents of Ward 8. So as I mentioned earlier, as part of the 2003 uh, framework plan, there were a set of guiding principles that came along with that that the community developed. First of all, there was this, this idea of capturing the unique identity to create a, uh, a sense of place on the campus, uh, reinvigorating the campus. Um, it was a historic campus. So again, preserving and celebrating the historic heritage of the community. As I mentioned before, also improving connectivity, opening up the campus. You know, for years, this, this beautiful amenity within the community had just lain there with walls around it, not being able to traverse the, the campus, recognizing that it was once a mental, mental health institute, but once that closed, having the opportunity to really open it up and expand it to the public in terms of the resources and the goods needed in the community of Ward 8 and creating a strong public realm that would offer um, the open spaces, the passive recreation, and some of the, again, as I mentioned, some of the amenities that were sorely lacking in the Congress Heights neighborhood. All of these were envisioned as being some strong opportunities for redevelopment of the East Campus that did contain a lot of the goods and uses that were sorely needed in the community. So this was our initial concept of the master plan. And as you can see, that red circle there indicates some of the contemplation that we had in terms of what would it look like to bring a metro station to this area of the campus. The initial metro station, um, if you can see my cursor here, is located here at the southwestern portion of the campus, which would have been a pretty long walk if we did actually have FEMA located where this red, red kind of border is here. This would be... Um, the, the opportunity to provide the services and amenities for residents, which would include office space and other uses that would benefit the community and the DHS employees. So the features of the small area plan built upon the core principles of the 2003 plan. Um, the primary concept of the plan was reconnecting the East Campus to the community, both physically, economically, as well as historically. And then including the North parcel, as I mentioned before, here in the red, highlighted here that um, was reserved for FEMA, and then also providing a framework for land use, height, density, and circulation throughout the campus. As I mentioned before, the plan was approved by council in 2008, and it was one of the first steps towards implementation, but there were many other challenges that came up in the impl implementation phase, which I'll talk about a little bit later. One aspect of the 2012 master plan and design guidelines was that it established zoning on the site. We worked closely with the Department of Planning and Economic Development in concert with our Development Review Division to provide zoning on the site that was based on the densities and land uses used to, that were prescribed for the site. Another thing was it fulfilled the requirements of the local historic preservation law the 1989 Memorandum of Agreement, the MOA, and the deed between the district and the federal government that governs the process for redeveloping the campus. Now, due to the size and scale of the campus, phases had to be developed on site. So this plan took into consideration infrastructure costs, site access, and historic requirements. And so the master plan identified an initial development phase and initial implementation strategy that went along with that development phase. Some of the development opportunities that, that came along with this was the preservation and adaptive reuse of some of the buildings which were part of the historic campus. There was about 100, eight, excuse me, 800,000 gross square foot of historic buildings on the East Campus. This was also an opportunity to expand retail and housing choices for Ward 8 residents, as well as federal employees who we saw having an opportunity to relocate themselves here, um, both to work and to live. And then also create an innovation hub for the national security and homeland security industries, which was contemplated at that time that we were working with some of the innovation hubs to see if they, they too could locate some of their services here to the East Campus. Christy also touched upon this about the uh, coordination for the consulting part. 
Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act mandates that federal agencies must consider the effects of their undertakings on historic properties, which are buildings, sites, structures, roads, and other objects eligible or listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And under Section 106, federal agencies are required to consider the effects of their undertakings on historic properties in consultation with historic preservation stakeholders. We managed to undertake seven consulting party, excuse me, seven con consulting party meetings were, were taken within this whole uh, master planning process. And so as part of that consultation, there was a strong preference for relocation of the contributing buildings rather than have them demolished. Um, some of the things that they were concerned about were the protecting the views into the campus, both from MLK Junior Avenue as well as Alabama Avenue. And there was a, a concern about the sensitive infill that would be taking place with regard to transition and height and density, which then again goes along with the zoning that was applied to the site to really adhere to that desire. And also the stabilization and adaptive reuse of historic buildings to further, um, to avoid further deterioration of those buildings. So those meetings were had um, over the course of the planning process, seven of them were take, took place. And these were some of the concerns that came out of that process that we looked at as we were developing the recommendations for the master plan. And some of those challenges um, were not surprising. Um, there was a lot of significant costs which would be taking place for transportation and utility infrastructure. Um, the cost to stabilize and adaptively reuse some of the historic buildings increased. Um, because a lot of the buildings were in a state of deterioration, as you can see here in some of these pictures. And the historic buildings had limited reuse potential. They, they, the, the footprints were no longer um, valid. The floor plans really couldn't be reused. So there are a lot of challenges associated with that. And also the existing circulation on campus was really insufficient for new development, which was why we had to work in consult with the Department of Transportation in providing a new road network, which would be um, inclusive to the new development pattern, the new development patterns which were created on the site. Community engagement was a huge part of this undertaking. We had three public meetings, four stakeholder advisory group meetings, as I mentioned, seven consultation, consulting parties meetings. And then we had a, a board which was um, formulated by the mayor herself, which was the St. Elizabeth's East Redevelopment Initiative. We had a series of four of those board meetings, as well as three ANC 8C, in which St. Elizabeth is located in ANC 8C. We had three briefings to that particular ANC. And then some of the community assets um, that are currently undertake that are currently being undertaken um, are the 801 East Men's Shelter, as you see there highlighted in blue. It was completed in September of just this year. Um, and it's a design and construction of a new shelter to replace the existing 801 East shelter. And it includes a new access road. And then also the horse stable and dry barn stabilization project. Um, again, that was completed in October of 20. And it was a renovation stabilization of the horse stable, dry barn and farm way station. And again, this was part of the first phase of development. And as continuous phases evolve, um, we're getting an indication of this campus really growing out and merging into this open space connectivity to the neighborhood, to the community um, of uses. And um, a lot of the, the uses that the community said that they wanted to see are now being part of this development as the implementation continues over the phases. And with that, I'll pass it over to Valicia. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Valicia Wilson, and I am the current Ward 8 planner with the DC Office of Planning. Um, and I'll be discussing the ongoing development and community impacts, um, particularly equity. Um, so as Evelyn mentioned, um, the, there, the development at San Elizabeth is ongoing um, and is currently being managed by the Deputy Mayor's Office for Planning and Economic Development. Um, these efforts are guided by these numerous planning efforts for San Elizabeth's East. Um, we're currently in phase two, which is scheduled to wrap in 24, in, I'm sorry, in 2024. Um, so far, we have seen some street and landscaping improvements, including um, some water retention uh, infrastructure um, in our landscaping. Um, Evelyn mentioned that we have um, already completed the stabilization of historic resources. 
Next slide. Um, the sports entertainment arena has been developed and has already been a draw for visitors to uh, St. Elizabeth's and the Congress Heights neighborhood. And uh, we are, have already seen a uh, over 200 unit apartment community. Um, there are residents that are there and majority of those units are affordable. And in the near term, um, in addition to parking um, for all of the uses and homes and retailers and offices that will be on the site, um, we also have broken ground on 90 townhome units, which are uh, illustrated here. Um, as well as uh, Evelyn mentioned, the 396 bed men's shelter um, and the new hospital, which will serve Ward 8, uh, the surrounding community, and, um, and meet some of the, the medical needs that um, exist in the community. As St. Elizabeth continues to develop, uh, both the site and the surrounding communities will see the following impacts, uh, which include more green space, um, community services, and retail. Um, as well as uh, events, both in public space and also at the sports entertainment arena. Um, one of the major contributions of, of, of this site to the community and to the district are increased housing options, um, as well as the improved proximity to emergency health care with the new hospital. Um, there's a, there will be plenty of new office opportunity. And, oh, oops, sorry. Sorry about that, Lizzie. Uh, but there's gonna be a new office opportunity um, and visitors will be coming from all over for the um, whatever new retail draws, new regional retail um, and other entertainment that may come in the future as well as sports entertainment uh, arena. And then there will also see increased Mitchell ridership. However, as uh, these these amenities come to St. Elizabeth's and to the Congress Heights community. Longtime residents are understandably concerned about whether they will benefit from these investments um, or whether they will ultimately place um, being priced out and ultimately displacement. Um, some of the concerns that we hear from nearby residents, particularly Congress Heights residents, are concerned about whether jobs that come to St. Elizabeth East will be accessible, um, whether the housing that will come to St. Elizabeth will be accessible. Uh, there is concern about the impact of businesses uh, with new businesses and new retailers coming. What would the impacts be to the existing uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue uh, Southeast uh, commercial corridor? There are plenty of businesses there that can be impacted. But really the question is, is this for us or is this for new residents um, that are coming to the district or to Ward 8? And the community does have a right to be concerned. Um, there are a number of vulnerable residents in the Congress Heights community. Um, residents here make up about 3% of the district population. Um, there is a good mix of both youth and adults, but there are also a good number of seniors. And this is a community that is predominantly black. Um, additionally, 40% of Congress Heights residents are living below the poverty line compared to 18% of districts um, of district residents overall. So residents here are, you know, really are, face poverty already and housing and high housing costs. 50% um, of residents spend, uh, I'm sorry, the vast, the vast majority of residents spend over 50% of their income on housing. As we know, that the sweet spot is really about 30%. Um, so with so many renters, so many residents spending so much on even um, lower cost market rate housing, there is a concern that if prices go up, people won't be able to afford it, to afford it and they'll, be, they'll need to move. Um, and so the new development in St. Elizabeth really does uh, make Congress Heights residents um, and business owners and stakeholders vulnerable to displacement and, and, and other adverse effects of redevelopment. To mitigate these effects, district government is applying its equity focus to the redevelopment um, of St. Elizabeth's East and the impact on the surrounding community. Uh, so our most our new comprehensive plan which was approved this year, a reorients place making in the district and in those investments to center equity both in our processes and in our outcomes. Um, so as part of the redevelopment of St. Elizabeth's, new housing will advance uh, Mayor Bowser's housing goals of new affordable units, um, 36,000 overall in the district, but 12,000 um, affordable units. 
Um, so there will be more uh, affordable uh, units coming to St. Elizabeth's. Um, we're also working to identify strategic investments that can, in, that can benefit vulnerable residents. And so as the Deputy Mayor's Office of Planning and Economic Development redevelops the site um, through the RFP process, they are looking for development teams that are invested in you know, working with community partners, really tailoring their building programs to meet community needs, um, both in housing, but also for community space, um, for um, needs like accessible childcare um, or you know, uh, office space for nonprofit organizations. Those are all things that um, we're looking for our development teams that are coming onto the site to, um, to address in their development. Um, and we are specifically uh, embarking on equity planning that centers the potential disparate impacts of this and other developments nearby on the larger Congress Heights community. And we're doing that in the form of the Congress Heights Small Area Plan, uh, which is underway and set to be um, to go to council in 20, it, it's going to right now, set to go to council next year. Um, and it's being developed as an equity plan and it is intended to really center the current residents, um, as I mentioned before, predominantly African-American residents, um, residents um, that are live below the, the poverty line and are vulnerable in, in a variety of different ways. Um, and so the thinking for this plan is really, you know, what, what recommendations need to be made to district government agencies, um, what recommendations need to be developed with our community partners to ensure that residents are prepared for the changes that are coming in St. Elizabeth so that they can take advantage of the new opportunities that exist. Um, and the recommendations um, target, target St. Elizabeth's to, only to the point that we are reinforcing the connection to the surrounding community, both physically, um, through programming, through economic development. Um, and so you can see here in an outlined in red, the study area for the Congress Heights Small Area Plan. Um, we see where St. Elizabeth sits, which is right at the community. Um, and so this view development is a good, you know, third of this community and it does have an impact. Um, and so, uh, next slide. Some of our, um, some of our approach is through these recommendations. Um, so as St. Elizabeth is part of the Congress Heights community, the Congress Heights Small Area Plan is taking uh, the following steps to ensure inclusivity um, through these draft recommendations. Um, you'll notice here that there aren't many recommendations about the actual um, land use and things like that. The St. Elizabeth East Plan already has a master plan and small area plans cannot amend those. Um, and so what we're looking at really are those connections, um, that inclusivity. So that includes reducing physical barriers between the campus and the community. Um, and that looks like more inclusive landscaping, pu public space that bridges the Congress, Congress Heights to the campus. Um, we're looking at shared parking and microtransit hubs that um, really recognizes that St. Elizabeth is a part of the Congress Heights community and thinking about where those hubs, um, where that parking is located so that that connection is very clear. We're also recommending um, in our draft recommendations wayfinding that identifies the um, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue commercial quarter as a destination um, so that if you, you know, get off the metro and you go right into St. Elizabeth, you also see that there's also a historic commercial, um, commercial uh, center you know, a couple blocks away. And, and that can help generate business for the businesses that are already in the community. Um, we're also recommending expanded medical and related job opportunities so that residents can benefit from the new hospital. Um, and uh, another recommendation that we've drafted for the Congress High Small Area Plan is one um, that lays the groundwork for a centralized housing database and housing literacy resource to increase the accessibility, not just to the new housing that comes on to St. Elizabeth's, but also the housing um, that comes as a result of St. Elizabeth's development. Um, and that's, and um, our hope is that is to work with community partners to target those resources specifically to uh, low income black residents. Um, finally, we're working with DC public libraries uh, to uh, we've been collecting information for public libraries to um, really gauge what people need out of their library as the new library for the Congress Heights community is being located at St. Elizabeth. So in one way that will bring residents onto the campus, um, but then we also need to be sure that the library as a resource is 
draw it actually does draw residents from off the campus onto the campus and isn't geared to just to new residents and um, working with easy libraries is really great because they understand that charge and they're really excited about making sure that the new library um, does serve the community both current and longtime residents um, and new residents as well all right thank you julia i see you were able to join us um yeah I just wanted to say thank you to everybody uh, on the panel and to APA, uh, the National Capital Area Chapter, for hosting us. I know we're really close to running out of time, so you tell me, Tony, what the next step is. Um, we did start a little late, so um, we have about five minutes if you want to take a couple questions. If anybody has any questions, feel, feel free to put those into chat. Otherwise, I think Julia, you might have a couple questions as well. So, sure. So maybe I can ask um, Evelyn and Delicia and Christy to join join us again on the screen. And um, I don't see uh, any questions in our chat or question yeah. and answer section. So feel free. Okay. Um, and and maybe uh, just one of the things I can follow up with Delicia on is um and evelyn is over time um how have you seen the concerns of the community have they evolved in terms of what they're concerned about um and are there new issues for them as this project has really taken you know almost 20 years to keep you know it's it's in a very long term uh phase so maybe you could just comment on on anything you've seen that's emerging or changing with the community. Evelyn, do you want to start? Well, I mean, I, I not being in that community any longer, it's, it's a little hard for me to to actually answer that. But I know during the the development of the small area plan, there were concerns just about what opportunities would exist for the residents currently there at in Congress Heights. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about bringing all of these amenities on campus, um, but to what extent would they help to serve the community? And, you know, with the redevelopment happening at a pretty rapid pace now with the sports and entertainment arena and some of the other things occurring on, on the campus, I, I, I too would like to get a sense of, of whether that helps to alleviate some of the concerns that the community is now kind of more welcome into the campus, or if there are some other concerns that Felicia might be able to, to, to help us understand a little bit more. So I'll say that the, um, the concerns evolved with where district government is in the process. Um, and so, and I mean, and really it, some residents will describe it as a, a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, we, we're like, okay, this new site is coming up for an RFP. Well, how do we make sure that this site, you know, that this developer, you know, acknowledges us and, you know, put some build something that will serve us as well. Um, and so, I, so I think that that's been um, so that that's kind of how it's how it's evolved. And I know that um, the community partners have been thinking about the, the ways the concerns have evolved and are trying to come up with a kind of a community benefits agreement menu um, so that there is, so that it's less of a game of whack-a-mole and the community can really just get on one accord with the master planning, implementation of the master plan of St. Elizabeth's um, so that the concerns can can kind of be, be addressed as the project goes um, without having okay. to reconvene everyone for every time something new happens and every time an RFP goes out. That's great. Well, um, thank you. Um, we did get a couple of questions. Um, and maybe I'll, this might be a good one for Christy, if you're on to start. What were the criteria for considering demolition of buildings versus adaptive reuse? Um, can you talk a little bit about, about some of the thinking around that? Yeah, maybe first absolutely. on the West Campus. And then we can ask yeah. how that works on East Campus too. Absolutely. So the original master plan, we were um, planning to rehab 62 of the contributing buildings. And that was still the goal going into the, the master plan amendment that we just went through. However, um, we, there were trade-offs because we didn't have money. Um, the other big issue with what buildings came down versus were retained um, 
there's, as I mentioned, some slope instability, and we have to lay back the slope um, in the area of the plateau where the new CISA headquarters building is going. To do that, there were two buildings that were in the way automatically, um, and they couldn't have been, um, because of their condition and because of the extent of the site work that needed to be done, they could not, they were not good candidates for moving or for um, stabilizing while you were doing the work. So they were gonna come out. Um, and then there are two additional buildings. I think with, with a, we're actually removing five. One is a small staff cottage. There are actually six on the campus. And so we figured, okay, we've got other representation. So in terms of the trade-off, we tried to make sure that we had representative samples of each of the different um, architectural styles, as well as the, the area that we are removing buildings was the one that can really accommodate the most development. And so, we focus there. There are two other buildings that are, are larger um, sort of iconic buildings that you would you would think of the campus with the, the terracotta tile roofs and the um, you know brick facades. Unfortunately, it really was where we could get the most um, bang for our buck in terms of construction space with the least impact on the historic um, feeling and context of the campus. And, and these are kind of um, while we originally attended smaller buildings, it actually turned out to be more impactful to the campus than to large buildings because it allowed um, for us to retain the sense of the landscape and the open views out to the city. Um, so there were a number of things, both not just cost, but also just how we could retain the overall context of the campus. Okay, great, thanks. Um, just, I'm gonna move to the other question, which I think could be for everybody, and that is, to sort of talk about um, how you've thought about managing the transportation uh, impacts and creating multimodal connections that serve not only both campuses but the community, because you know this is this is a lot of development in this in this area. So whoever wants to take that, hop right in. Well, Julia, for the for the East Campus, we actually worked in consult with the Department of Transportation. And as we were doing the land use for the site, they were working on the road network and they conducted an environmental assessment because we did develop two actual development alternatives. And the one that we chose that I that I that I showed earlier was the one that had the least impact on the historic resources was the road network that we went with. Um, it also offered more connectivity, more permeation within the campus to where there would be a little bit more passive and active space for people to traverse within the community um, as opposed to the other road network. So that was but done again um, in consultation with DDOT. And we did look at the impacts that that road network would have on the infrastructure and also the cost associated with developing a brand new road network for that for, for the campus. Okay. Um, Christy, anything on your side in yeah. terms of either thinking about transportation or how you've coordinated with the district um, on thinking through sure. this? Sure. Um, and I'll admit this is way outside of my um, lane of expertise, but um, we we did a complete um, transportation management plan for the campus. We um, will meet the, the um, NCPC set parking ratios for that area of the city. And the, the campus, as we've envisioned internally, it is, it is a closed campus, it's a level five campus, but we have cited all the parking at the perimeter so that it is immediately accessed. So within the campus, it will be pedestrian and shuttle buses will be running shuttle buses from the metro metros. Um, there's a, a road widening project that will have to happen along MLK to allow um, for bus um, turning. Um, some of the, the, the community congestion issues there. We're also adding um, some capital bike share stations outside the, the gate. So they'll both serve the campus as well as the adjacent um, communities. And then we've built an access road off of 295 Shepherd Parkway to access the campus from the um, western side. Uh, and that it's coming online and it will be actually GSA gave the money to DDOT. We partnered, partnered with DDOT and they've built it for us. And that's getting ready to come online along with a multi multimodal um, trail parking bike. I mean, I'm sorry, walking pedestrian and, and bike along the um, eastern or western edge of the campus. Okay. Um, I, I think that's, uh, that's great. And I, I know um, in your presentation, um, Evelyn, I think you even talked about the discussion that happened around 2012 to consider 
having a metro station uh, closer and that that was an option that just ultimately didn't quite move forward. But um, it is, uh, it's been pretty remarkable to see all the planning that's gone in around trying to create multimodal options for a site with both the, um, it's, it's a little bit physically uh, mm -hmm. challenging to get there as well as some of the security requirements that make that particularly the West Campus challenging. Um, Tony, uh, we're at 510, um, which is close to, I think when most people are thinking about uh, perhaps the APA, um, Ah, I don't know what to call it, but you need to go home and have dinner, or maybe yes. <laughs> you're already at home and, and want to have dinner. Um, but again, um, I, I really want to thank the panel. Um, this was an enormous amount of information that they've shared with you on what is actually, if you think about it, on the West Campus, this is the largest federal capital investment in a facility since the Pentagon. It's really astonishing. And on the district side, it's been an equally significant commitment of public and private sector resources to create a campus uh, that will serve the needs of um, Southeast Washington. So I wanna thank all of our panelists who've done such an amazing job. Um, and again, to thank um, the National Capital Area for this opportunity. Um, so thank you. We appreciate yeah. you being here this evening. Um, on behalf of the board and all of the people who are uh, listening in, whether they're in their office or at their home, um, we appreciate your time uh, dedicated to putting this program together. I would like to let people know um, that we do have a Twitter account, NCAC underscore APA, again, AC, NCAC underscore APA. We are posting a daily trivia question. So go there, check out the daily trivia question, answer that and you'll be entered in a drawing for a copy of Ju uh, Ileana Proust's book, Recast Your City. Um, she was our keynote speaker yesterday. So go there, answer the question, and hopefully you will win. Um, thank you so much. Everybody have a great evening. Be sure to log your credits after this. Um, again, thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.